this session aims to provide tips and resources to early career researchers, as well as showcase current research and work conducted across Welsh universities. We're really delighted to have some excellent speakers to deliver the event. These are early career researchers who are members of our network and who also have expertise in researching well-being in different settings in Wales. They're passionate about promoting mental health resources and willing to share their experiences of fostering wellnesses as early career researchers themselves. I'd also like to introduce our fellow, Professor Anne John, who's going to chair the session. Um, Professor John is a clinical professor of public health and psychology at psychiatry at Swansea University with a background in public health and general practice. Her research focuses on suicide and self-harm prevention and children and young people's mental health. Anne leads the Suicide Information Database Cymru and during COVID, COVID led the Living Systematic, Re Systematic Review on Suicide Prevention and the Global Suicide Study. She chairs the National Advisory Group on Suicide and Self-Harm Prevention to Welsh Government and co-chairs the Cross Government Group. Uh, and also received our Frances Hogan Medal in 2022 for her work on mental health and prevention of suicide and self-harm. So we're really uh, grateful to have her today. And so I'm going to hand over to you now, Anne. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Cathy, for inviting me to, to chair this session. So it's always weird listening to your own biography, isn't it? Oh, and I'll just say cheese and onion crisps, don't mind which brand. Um, and listening to that biography, it, it shows that in my career now, I'm really focused on what we call mental health. But my background is general practice and public health. So I cut my teeth on well-being and on all the debates that we have, both within academia and services about what well-being is. And I think, you know, and I guess in many situations, I'm still having that conversation because well-being means different things to different people. But I guess when I think about it, I think it's much more about how people feel and how they can cope and function in life. And what that means is that you can have a mental health diagnosis and still have poor or good well-being. And I think one of the things that well-being has done really successfully compared to when you think about mental health, stroke, mental illness, is I think it hasn't gone down that road of the division between mind and body. And I think it's really handled that successfully and shown how interdependent um, all these things are. And by mind and body, I'm talking about diet, environment, all those things that we know affect both mental well-being and mental illness, but I think are much less discussed in the field of mental illness. So, I'm not going to say a lot more. We've got four really excellent speakers. Um, the way that the session is going to work is that we're going to have um, each of the speakers is going to talk for about 10 minutes. And then I will ask them a couple of questions. And then we're going to um, open up for you to have discussions in either in breakout rooms or in, in one room, um, to have sort of those one-to-one -one discussions with our speakers. And then we'll all come back together at the end for about 20, 25 minutes, um, depending how good they all are at keeping to time, to have a group discussion about everything that we've seen and talked about. So I'm going to... Um, I'm going to introduce first Dr. Tegan Brearley Solis. I hope I pronounced that right. He's going to talk about surfing the waves of compassionate accountability, which is a great title. She's a lecturer in um, policing criminology and trauma informed approaches at Glendale University. One 
thing I would say is there's just increasing recognition, I think, across both fields of how it's almost just chance whether, whether young people fall into health or fall into the criminal justice system with lots of the young people that we're all working with. Um, Tegan's a member of the Social Inclusion Research Institute at, at Wrexham and the Trauma and ACE Trace Informed University Project. I mean, reading all that, we do, we have lots of crossovers, Tegan, in the sorts of work that we do. And Tegan has experience of volunteering with children and adults involved in the criminal justice system across both statutory and voluntary services. Um, and during her PhD studies, Tegan created a concept to explain trauma and trauma-informed practice in a clear and accessible way. And I think you can't underestimate how important that is across all the different settings working in this area. Trauma is defined differently and having um, definitions that everyone can engage with is really important. Um, and as part of that, she's since developed an, an animation called Navigating the Storm, which you should all look up. So over to you, Tegan. Thank you very much. I'm just going to um, share my screen. So hopefully, um, great, excellent. So um, Thank you, everyone, for coming along today. It's great to be here and I'm really pleased to join you all. So, um, yeah, so my name is Tegan and um, my talk today is titled Surfing the Waves of Compassionate Accountability. My, the theme is quite nautical um, because that is the, the theme of the animation, Navigating the Storm. Um, but I actually wanted to start the, um, my presentation today by sharing with you um, one of my favorite quotes. I am a lover of quotes, and there is two that I'm gonna share with you today. Um, but the first is a Ram Dass quote. And Ram Dass says that when you go into the woods, you see all different trees. Some of them are bent, some of them are gnarled, some are evergreens, all different kinds. And you look at the tree and you allow it and you understand why it might be a certain way. Maybe it didn't get enough water or maybe it didn't get enough light, but you still appreciate it for its beauty. And Ramdas practices turning people into trees. And hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll see the importance of me telling this story. So I just wanted to um, talk to you first and foremost about my journey, my voyage. I told you it'd be very nautical themed. Um, so I started my PhD in 2018. And um, what I wanted to explore was trauma informed. Uh, well, first, I wanted to explore trauma informed interventions within North Wales Youth Justice Service. But as we all know, when you do a PhD, it doesn't always work as you expect it to. So my path did change and I didn't end up doing um, specific trauma informed interventions. What I instead looked at was trauma informed culture, um, because talking to people, they were very much saying, actually, there's not a specific intervention that we use. It's just the way that certain that that we are as, as people and the culture of the organization. So um, that of course changed. And um, what also changed was the data collection um, because I started to collect data just before the um, pandemic hit. So some of my data collection, I was able to do face to face. Um, some of it I had to carry out online and I had to make quite a lot of decisions around um, how I was going to interview children because children, I really wanted the child's voice to be key and central to this piece of work. And the idea was that I was interviewing children who uh, were justice involved children and um, experiencing the trauma informed culture emerging within youth justice. So I was able to do that um, first before uh, lockdown and I interviewed some children and I spoke to them and I also asked them what would make this experience better for you and they came back with some really amazing ideas about doing activities while we were talking so I made changes um, to my ethics application it was all approved I was ready to go out and do some baking with the children um, do some crafts activities all of that then of course lockdown happened so I couldn't actually do that um, and I had to make a decision well what what could I do what would be appropriate and I wanted to ensure that I was trauma informed in my own approach so I made the decision to not interview any more children 
based based on that because it's a sensitive topic area and I would have had to carry out the interviews online and I, and I and I didn't want to do that but I was able to continue interviewing professionals um but it did alter the um the path of my of my research um so I'm just picked out some key points really in, in my journey and one of the key points was my taking part in the visualizing research competition and you can see my photo on screen which I titled the serene storm within and the idea of taking part in the competition was to um, share an image that would represent my research through a photo and I again I stuck with a nautical theme and I kind of decided that actually we don't know what's hidden beneath the depths of, of water for a start the same way we don't know what's hidden beneath the depths of human beings and I also liked the idea of of a ripple effect and um, the way that you know just even just smiling at somebody can you know alter the way that they feel in that moment um, and so I did enter the competition and actually that got me thinking about how I could talk about my research in a more accessible way so I presented uh, at my first conference in 2019, which was the Ace Hub conference, and this was really the start of navigating the storm because I remember thinking at the time, how can I talk about my research in a way that is clear and accessible and um, lends itself to the complexity of trauma and trauma informed practice. And so I started to use metaphors like water, boats, um, all of that kind of thing um, to, to explore that and explain that. And um, I can put the link to navigate the storm in the chat for you to watch and that would make all of this much you make uh, much more sense when you when you watch that um and then of course as i said i steered my research in a new direction um based on on conversations that i was having with individuals and um based on covid19 as well and how that Im influenced and impacted the path that my journey was taking what I also wanted to do was um, ensure I did the 10 trauma informed principles coined by Elliot and colleagues in 2005 during my data collection. The principles were adapted for use in research with victims of sexual violence by Campbell and colleagues in 2019, which I also followed and adapted as appropriate for this piece of research. And I led with the awareness that anyone can be um, a trauma survivor of some description. And so I applied such principles to both interviews and focus groups with children and service providers. And this included, for example, understanding the coping mechanisms identified by participants and the continuing impact which trauma has had on their lives, including involvement with the criminal justice system. Um, another principle is to emphasise individual strengths and resiliency, which I attempted to do via the use of active listening techniques uh, to understand choices made, whilst also highlighting strengths picked up in the conversations. Um, and I also tried to ensure that the environment in which the data collection took place felt safe for the individuals because being safe and feeling safe are two very different things. So I wanted to ensure that they actually felt safe as well. Um, and then very quickly, before I tell you about some of my findings, I just thought I would touch on my own well-being during um, the PhD. So techniques that I used to look after myself um, and for me, the biggest thing that I did was actually learning to separate myself from my PhD research, because what I found was that it became very much part of my identity. So when I was talking to people for the first time, I would introduce myself through my PhD and I kind of felt that I lost myself a little bit um, and I, I forgot who I was. So towards the end of my PhD, <laughs> I started to learn my lesson and, and thought, actually, no, I'm not my PhD, I'm Tegan. Um, and so that actually really helped me to, um, it helped me with, you know, any anxiety that I had around the PhD and particularly around uh, Viva time where I was thinking, oh no, if I don't, you know, this, my whole identity depends on this. Actually, I was able to separate myself and, and that really helped me to look after myself and allow me to find the things that I really enjoyed doing as a person. And I ensured that I did those each week um, to, you know, whatever that might have been to really help myself um, through the journey. So my talk today is about compassionate accountability and trauma-informed practices knitting into the fabric of many organizations and spheres, including the criminal justice system. And research suggests correlation between trauma and those who interface with the criminal justice system. However, confinement within the criminal justice system is designed for those who offend rather than those who have experienced adversity. So many practices and procedures which exist within the criminal justice system, such as disciplinary approaches, strip searches, and restriction on movement might be traumatizing or re-traumatizing for individuals 
individuals and in turn may lead to an increase in behaviour reflective of trauma, such as aggression, which can be challenging for staff. Trauma-informed practice might be seen as beneficial. However, the challenge lies in managing perceptions of viewing offending via a trauma-informed lens as, as being overly sympathetic whilst disregarding the victim. Instead, the context of offending should be considered alongside trauma histories. So Miller and uh, Najavit suggest that despite challenges, and careful considerations which must be made, trauma informed practice can enhance the criminal justice um, system environment in terms of safety, resulting in better outcomes for individuals who interface with the criminal justice system and develop pro-social coping skills. Um, trauma informed uh, culture within the criminal justice system does not mean individuals will not be held accountable because they will, but, but this happens in a compassionate way. So working through a trauma informed lens means employing gentle curiosity around an individual, their behavior and responses and developing a culture and indeed interventions which support the development of emotion regulation skills, empathy and personal ownership of change whilst contextualizing their behavior. So I'm gonna tell you about some of the findings in my research. Um, one finding in particular that relates to well-being. So it's recognized that trauma histories are prevalent in both children accessing youth justice and those in custody. And this was reflected in my study. So I didn't ask the children about their personal experiences of trauma, but interestingly, each child opened up and told me their story. Um, and I found that it, when, um, when there was a child practitioner relationship formed between the child and their case manager, um, that can be often viewed via a therapeutic lens and a therapeutic relational space. So when working in a relational and therapeutic way, space is created which allows for the sharing of trauma narratives which can encourage healing for the children. And life experiences, both positive and negative, move beyond the senses and become organised into stories, which help individuals narrate who they are and reflect on the complexities of life events. Both children and service providers involved in the study alluded to the crisis management aspect of youth justice. Um, so talking through challenges and previous trauma may lead Sorry, to emotional... one minute left. Okay, Le lead to emotional catharsis. Um, one of the children in the study discussed how attending the youth justice supports their well-being because they can discuss issues and express their feelings. So what I found was that it was very much um, there was um, it was kind of like two sides to one coin. So there was a healing aspect for the children. I'm just going to skip through these. Um, but there was also um, a risk to staff who may experience vicarious trauma. So. Um, that was through the transference of emotional residue from those who've experienced trauma onto those who engage with them in an empathic relationship. So there was, although it could be seen as very healing, sharing their trauma narrative, and that was still encouraged to do so, there needed to be, um, there needs to be support for staff because there is a risk to them in experiencing vicarious trauma. Um, and actually that can then lead out, lead on to burnout, um, issues around um, remaining in, in that world. Um, and, and their, their well being being compromised as well. Um, so I've kind of um, put some of my findings onto one slide so you could see what, what they are. Um, but there was many findings in the study, some that um, include offending behaviors perceived as a strategy to communicate distress, which might be via coping mechanisms. Um, a cultural shift is required in order to embed values, policies and practice across all levels of youth justice. Um, and of course, the, the space and relationship shared between children and practitioners involves elements of, of therapeutic processes, which is often used by counsellors. Um, but we need to, to be mindful of the repercussions of falling, uh, forming healing relationships, including the risk of vicarious um, trauma, which my study did find to be an important issue, which requires addressing at a strategic level in order to adequately support staff and the children that they're working with. So I'm going to finish with another quote. <laughs> um, and I'm just bringing it back really to um, this, which I think summed up my, my experience um, really well, and the stories of the children and the service providers. And that is, we are not the survival of the fittest, we are the survival of the nurtured. That was fascinating and definitely in my work on self-harm, you know, that contact with criminal justice is 
is really important. I guess my two questions were, has anyone done any work interviewing victims and how they would feel about this sort of approach? Because we often, you know, and you said it yourself, that that's what the tension is. But if you think of sort of the restorative practice work that goes on, you know, I just wondered if there's evidence that people actually felt like that, particularly in relation to child crime. Yeah, so as far as I'm aware, there's not been anything in, in that area. But what I was finding was that um, it was it tended to be service providers that were talking about this tension and saying that what they had experienced when they were going out into the community was often um, individuals were saying, well, why, why are they... Um, you know going on going on this trip um, kayaking or something like that when they've done this you know and and there wasn't there was kind of a um, misunderstanding on the benefits of building those relationships in order to then help them build the emotion regulation skills those empathy some of the some of those um, development points that they might have missed because of what they had experienced Um, but I couldn't find I didn't find any any research that was carried out with victims but that would be really really interesting because sometimes people who haven't you know if you think about people in contact with the criminal justice system and also the fact that you know victims are often from challenging backgrounds themselves that maybe their understanding would be better and also the process of having been an experience than you know, Joe blogs on the street. Mm-hmm. Um, and then my second question was really about um, within your project, did you view that contact with the criminal justice system as a traumatic event in itself? Yes, yes, I did. So that was um, part of the uh, findings as well around, um, actually it came from both children and service providers. So um I, I remember one of the conversations that I had with one of the children and they were talking about visiting an old Victorian prison and they said it really scared me you know it was meant to be like a fun trip but they said it was it was really scary because they didn't want to be in that position themselves and they were talking about um um you know some of the kind of experiences that they'd had with with other service providers within the criminal justice system you know contact with police and things like that and how Um, that was quite scary and service providers themselves were also saying you know I couldn't imagine having to stand up in court and and talk about these things or um, you know be arrested and and go for all of that that is scary in and of itself and there are pieces of research which also talk about um, the trauma that individuals can face based on their own behaviors so if they have committed quite a violent offense how that can also lead to trauma symptoms and responses in that individual Um, so that's quite interesting as well I'm going to stop it there I could probably talk to you about this for hours but we are going to move on to Dr Paula Foscarini Craggs um, who's going to talk to us about um, her talks entitled just go for a walk which I think I think during the pandemic is something that came out very strongly in some of the work that I did, particularly with young people. So Paula obtained her degree in psychology from York University and then completed her doctorate in psychology um, with a focus on motivation, identity, physical activity and healthy eating at Swansea Uni. And she's now with the Centre for Trials Research at Cardiff University, working particularly uh, managing clinical trials in infections, inflammation, immunity, and brain health. Um, So I'm gonna hand over. Okay, Uh, thank you, Anne, for the introduction. Um, So yeah, so today I want to talk about uh, the role and importance of body-based strategies and well-being. So I think Anne earlier in her introduction about well-being alluded to that. Um, So I'm just going to talk about um, 
some of the work I've been doing more generally rather than specifically some of the work, but how this fits into some of the work that I've been doing um, and how I use it myself and why I think it's very important. Um, so I think my whole presentation can be summed up uh, in the wise words of Elle Woods from Legally Blonde, exercise gives you endorphins, endorphins make you happy. Um, so hopefully go out and exercise. So I'm just going to go through a couple of definitions um, so you understand where I'm coming from. So the WHO has defined healthy as the absence of disease, but more importantly, also the presence of mental and social well-being. Um, and then in my case, where I'm going to really be focusing on physical activity and physical activity is any activity where you move your body. Um, so lots of people think of physical activity as exercise, um, but physical activity can also be um, all of the incidental movements that you have to do, for example, walking to uni, walking to get your groceries, all of that sort of stuff. Um, but obviously it can be more formal schedules. So let's just say taking part in a football team or things like that. Now, you will have noticed I haven't defined well-being. Obviously, Anne's briefly talked about it, um, but I kind of really want to highlight the importance of uh, the biopsychosocial model, which is a big long word that basically means that well-being is a combination of physical health, so the biology, your mental health, your psychology, and your social connection. So that's that social aspect. And obviously the three of them together interact to predict. Now, what I'm gonna also highlight is the fact that actually all three of them can impact each other. And that sometimes you can have two of them, which are really strong and you can have uh, relatively good well-being, uh, but you really need all three of them to kind of really predict that well-being and to really feel like you are kind of able to achieve your goals um, and to kind of have that sense of wellness. <clears throat> um, now, the biopsychosocial model is quite popular um, with doctors and mental health practitioners. Um, but I still think, even though it's not so much in the well-being space, I think especially in the physical health space and the mental health space, they are a tendency to treat them separately. Um, but as I'll go on to talk about, that is actually does a lot of disservice um, to everybody. So why does it do a disservice? Um, basically, better physical health means better mental health. That interaction, those three overlapping spheres. Um, so physical activity does things like imp uh, help improve your mood, uh, your immune system, helps you sleep better, uh, makes you less likely to develop chronic health conditions. Um, but then if you do have a chronic health condition, it makes it easier to manage. So for example, things like diabetes and things like that with regular physical activity are much easier to manage. And obviously if you don't have all of those other things or if those things are easier to manage, then you generally have less stress in your life. Um, but it's not just that better physical health means that you have less stress in your life. Mental health symptoms can actually be experienced in the body. And that's basically called somatization. Um, so I would imagine many of us who have gone through stressful periods probably are familiar with that, familiar with that tight jaw or those tight shoulders. Um, that's basically somatization happening. Um, that's that mental, that stress being felt in the body, which makes it even more important to think about that physical health when you're thinking about your mental health and your well-being. So somatization can happen to all of us, but it's more likely to happen to certain groups of people. Um, so things like culture, stigma, uh, mental health literacy can play a really important role. Um, so the role of kind of culture and stigma are probably some of the biggest ones. Um, if you don't grew up in an area uh, where mental health and well-being is maybe not seen as a priority, you are probably more likely to internalize and feel all of those kind of mental health distress um, in through your body. And so that links into some of the work that I do with sanctuary seekers who have experienced trauma. And we use physical movement or we're helping to design a physical movement um, program to help kind of address those things. Um, but some of this stuff is very important to understand because how mental health support systems are set up um, can lead into and make it um, better or worse, I guess, uh, to address some of these issues. And that obviously a lot of mental health su support services may not necessarily set up to deal with physical manifestations of things um, or people don't go to the right services. Um, so if you are experiencing a lot of well-being issues or mental health issues in your body, you may more likely to go to a GP who might refer you on to 
you know, a physiotherapist or somebody when actually that's not who you necessarily need to talk to. Or maybe you need to talk to a physiotherapist and you need to talk to a mental health practitioner. Um, so understanding that um, interaction, I think, is becoming more and more popular, but it's also extremely important both for yourself. So you can say, oh, my shoulders are tight. I've been really stressed. Let me help manage my stress and that will fix my shoulders. Uh, but it can go the other way as well. Kind of addressing those physical things can help that mental aspect as well. So how do we do that? It's great to understand that they interact together, but obviously putting it into practical effect can sometimes be a little trickier. So regular physical activity can be effective at obviously reducing the symptoms like I talked about and increasing well-being, but it also can help prevent negative well-being in the first place. So there's a preventative effect. So getting into some sort of habit is the best way. Uh, the great news is, is that actually it doesn't matter what type of activity you do. What matters is that you do it. Um, so there is some research that has found that things like resistance exercise, so that's weightlifting and things like that, were maybe more effective at reducing symptoms of depression, whereas something like yoga is slightly better for anxiety. Um, so maybe you might want to consider that, or that's important, but really it's the activity that makes a difference. The other good news is any amount helps. You don't have to go out and run marathons to get the benefit even just a little bit every day, you know, that just go for a walk, just get out of your house, go for a 10 minute walk, um, can do wonders. And then the other thing um, that's really useful and kind of interesting thing to think about is that combining those mental health kind of mindfulness practices that are very common in mental health therapies um, with physical activity. And for people who are struggling with kind of sitting still and maybe doing that mindfulness, doing it while you're walking, going for a walk and thinking, okay, well, how does the ground feel? What are the sounds that I'm hearing around me? What does the air smell like? Those can get you into that habit of that mindfulness, which then might make it a little bit easier for you when you need to, if you're going to use it while you're sitting down and not and not moving. Um, or you might just always prefer doing it while you're moving. Um, but it's a good way of being introduced to those things because a lot of people are probably already familiar with that kind of focusing on body sensations while you're doing some sort of physical activity. Uh, and it's quite easy to then introduce as well in too. So I do wanna highlight that obviously kind of, it's not a magic cure and the kind of just go for a walk sometimes is used to dismiss the kind of severity of somebody's mental health challenges or well-being challenges. Um, so obviously physical activity may not work for everybody. Um, there are significant challenges around access. Thankfully, I think in Wales, we're quite lucky that there's a lot of outdoor parks and things like that around, but obviously not everybody is as lucky. Um, and so it's not always easy to access. And there can also be social stigma. Um, around kind of certain groups taking part in physical activity. A lot of women may feel uh, not safe doing it. Uh, people who are have a larger body size or perceive themselves as to be fat sometimes feels very kind of shy about doing that. Um, so it's not perfect. And then as I said, it can sometimes be used to dismiss those significant mental health challenges. But just because it is sometimes used as a dismissal, um, I still think it's a very important kind of strategic to use and then obviously getting started can be the hardest part so I'm just going to take a bit of a shift quickly uh, and talk about motivation uh, because obviously that kind of getting started being the hardest part is really kind of key sorry um, Paula there's a minute left yeah I'm almost done um, can be a really key bit. Um, so understanding that motivation lies along a continuum from one end, which is kind of controlled motivation where you feel pressure or guilt to do something to more autonomous motivation where you have that enjoyment, you're learning a new skill. So we want to kind of be at the autonomous end of the motivation spectrum when we're kind of establish a new habit. But sometimes having that guilt or that pressure will get you out the door, especially if you're not feeling up for it. So using those kind of combinations, finding something that you like, but sometimes having that guilt behind you to get you out the door to kind of get you moving in the first place. Um, physical activity can come with some other benefits. So things like if you're on a sports team, that brings in that social aspect, developing that community. 
Um, I won't talk about it a lot, but being in blue and green spaces, which is basically being in parks and nature, being in parks and nature have been found to be extremely beneficial for well-being. So moving out in parks and nature um, can be really helpful. And then doing it physical activity can also help things like cognition and things like that. Um, so just a quick summary. So if you forget everything else, remember this, move as much as you can in ways that bring you joy. And that's how you'll get the benefit of physical activity for well-being. So I guess the question I'm going to ask you, because it relates to coming from a psychology background rather than a public health background, is, you know, so, so the evidence in relation to physical activity and, and mental health was, was quite contentious a decade ago. Um, however, I think it's much stronger now particularly for anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. um, but when you think about things like motivation, you're very much, the onus is on the individual, isn't it? Do you think we'd be better off putting uh, more emphasis into sort of more population level activities to make people physically active? Or do I think you think we should focus on the individual? I think you need to do both because I think physical activity is can be such a personal thing about what you like to do. Um, so I think you need to do both. But I think there does need to be that access issue and that safety issue prevents a lot of people from going out and taking part. And I think that's a population level. Um, so I know England does a lot of social prescribing and I think that's starting to come over to Wales a lot more. So things like that, that make it easier to access maybe a gym membership if you don't have the finances, if you can get that through social prescribing, then you don't have to go out for a walk at night potentially where you may feel unsafe. Um, so I think it needs to be a combination of both. Um, having more population levels, having better street lights, making sure that everybody has access to a park somewhere near them, all of that sort of stuff. And then think about having those individual level discussions about what makes you happy when you go out and move, right? There's no point in doing football every week if you hate it because you won't go every week. But if you love yoga, go do yoga every week, right? As, as, as There is some evidence that some are better for some things, but really it's just going out and moving is a really important bit. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. I'm looking forward to some of the other discussions, but I'm going to move us along quickly. So our next speaker is Dr. Lucy Brinning, who's a health and wellbeing research development and innovation officer at Bangor University. So um, Lucy has a first class and a master's um, in psychology. And she's got a PhD in health economics, so that was quite a transition, but a very important one, in uh, mindfulness-based interventions. So um, she was co-author of a series of reports um, commissioned by Public Health Wales on the economic case for investment across the life course, including transforming young lives across Wales and living well for longer and wellness in work some of which I have definitely read. Um, so um, I'm going to hand over to Lucy. I want to start by asking us just to pause for a moment and just reflect on all the things we've done already today. Um, what has preoccupied uh, your thinking and where is your attention right now? For many early career researchers, life and work will involve a careful balance. Um, and if you're like me this morning, you've met perhaps been on the school run, you've been um, juggling um, emails and uh, research and maybe even teaching tasks. So um, my, my brain has been thinking back and working out where things are up to and thinking ahead as to what's um, yet to come. Um, and all while pretty much operating on, on autopilot. So uh, if you're willing to join me just for the next 10 minutes um, to think about, let's have a look at mindfulness um, and consider whether it can be a useful tool 
in supporting our well-being. I'm going to draw on some examples from its application in clinical settings, such as targeted mindfulness programmes for depression prevention, through to universal offerings for general population groups to help build resilience and to help us skillfully respond to stress. So, um, as I said, over the next 10 minutes, I'm going to talk about mindfulness. What is it, um, some of the research benefits and how it can be applied in different settings with different population groups. To just give a very brief insight into my own early, uh, my own ECR career so far, um, in, as um, Anne introduced in 2009, I, I completed my undergraduate degree in psychology um, and I was offered the opportunity to study mindfulness. It was an experiential module where we learned through practicing mindfulness, reflecting on our experience and learning about the psychological theory that underpinned the approach. I later went on to, to start a PhD evaluating mindfulness and then returned um, during this to teach the module to other undergraduate students. And today in my postdoctoral research role, I work with small businesses to um, across Ireland and Wales to help develop um, health and wellbeing innovation for consumers of their services and for staff working in their businesses. I balance this now part-time um, with um, a lecturing role, teaching public health and health promotion. So let's have a look at mindfulness. Mindfulness is about being aware of what is happening in the present on a moment, moment by moment basis. This can be contrasted with automatic responses and where our minds are elsewhere, doing things without attention behaving automatically on autopilot or preoccupation with memories, plans or worries. Mindfulness includes a sense of approaching our experiences with openness and kindly curiosity rather than avoiding difficult experiences or judging them. Mindfulness encourages to um, gently turn towards our negative experiences rather than blocking them out. And to illustrate this essence, um, the essence of this, I wanted to turn to a Wales-based um, environmental artist, Tim Pugh, um, who captures his art by photograph, by photograph and then leaves nature to take its course. Often the sea washing it away or wind dispersing the patterns he's made. Um, in, in my opinion, it, it captures this essence of being in that one moment. Mindfulness originates in Eastern meditation practices, but the form I'm talking about today is not dependent on any belief system or ideology. Mindfulness in this form is a completely secular approach. It can be practiced by anyone from any religion and, with, for, and practiced by those with none. Mindfulness as a Buddhist concept is very difficult to define. It's more of an abstract concept um, in its original form. However, John Kabat-Zinn offers this definition paying attention on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally. It's about directing our attention with intent to the right now, this moment, in a non-judgmental way. John Kabat-Zinn was trained as a molecular biologist, but also had an interest in meditation and yoga. And in the 1970s, he set about establishing a pain reduction clinic where, where he was based in the University of Massachusetts Medical Center. This was where he convinced convinced medical professionals um, to, um, to send to him um, anyone dealing with chronic pain or stress-related disorders, especially those who'd exhausted all medical treatment options. As a scientist, he knew the value of research and also set about evaluating his service. And he concluded that people were able to deal much better with their pain and also manage their life stresses. Um, after they'd attended his Mindfulness Based Stress Reduction Programme, or MBSR for short. So MBSR is now offered to generic groups of up to 30 participants. It's typically delivered as an eight-week programme and it consists of many component parts. And importantly for its evaluation, it can be considered a complex intervention. This is in that it draws from many different areas and consists of these interrelated components. It originates in Buddhist philosophy and is based on the principle of experience being at the heart of your learning. It's group based and for anyone who knows much about group therapies, the role of the group is thought to be quite important. People often feel a sense of empathy and shared learning. 
The teachings are informed by understanding of, um, of psychological responses to stress and practices are designed to help train our brains to skillfully respond to life stresses. Courses include psychoeducational psycho teachings, yoga, mindful movement, stories and poems, and a significant amount of personal mindfulness practice, both formal meditation practices, including breathing practices, body scans and mindful movement, alongside informal practices where people bring mindful attention to everyday activities. Now, MBSR now offers this a framework for the development of other courses which are based on it and share a set of key characteristics. Over the last couple of decades, mindfulness has received a large amount of media coverage and celebrity endorsements, all contributing to its high profile status. In 2014, mindfulness was set to have won global attention, including its appearance on Time magazine. And today it can be said that mindfulness is still trending. There's a wide variety of mindfulness applications in different populations and settings. Here are just a few examples, um, and there'll be many more that aren't presented here. Um, along with the increase in applications, importantly, the evidence base has also grown, and there's been an upsurge in academic papers on mindfulness. However, caution is needed. It's, not, it's easy to get caught up in the excitement around new innovations. However the, however, the evidence supporting new approaches is sparse in places, and it shouldn't be considered a treat all or a solution to all problems. Very quickly to whiz over some of the, um, the, the research around mindfulness. Um, Meta-analysis reviews support that mindfulness-based approaches yield at least a medium effect size. There's evidence to support that mindfulness reduces stress and mood disturbance. It improves mood regulation and can increase people's sense of control. The importance of practice has been highlighted by um, Michael Specker, Linda Carlson and colleagues who offered MBSR to a group of cancer patients. In this, um, in this study, the more time people spent practicing, the better their results. Neuroscience evidence has also helped us to better understand the mechanisms of mindfulness and exactly how it works. Um, how we use our brains can change the structure and functioning of our brains. We now know that the adult brain is much more malleable than previously thought. This premise of neuroplasticity, an area which continues to be researched in mindfulness. There's evidence to show that brain changes found in, in people who meditate can be linked to improved emotional regulation, less anxiety, um, a delay in brain aging and improved immune responses. So to take a quick spotlight on mindfulness for depression, um, Mindfulness-based cognitive ther therapy was developed um, and it was based on MBSR with the addition of um, elements of um, CBT aimed at the prevention Sorry, of Sorry, one minute, Lucy. Um, interestingly, um, from the research, we've moved to look at how this can be embedded into practice. So NICE um, are responsible for the development of guidance, which informs the commissioning of services. With limited healthcare resources and my background in health economics, we know that there's very diff diff often difficult decisions to be made about the best allocation of funds. And the most recent guidance of mindfulness, uh, most recent guidance on the prevent management and um, treatment of depression recommends mindfulness-based cognitive therapy as a key priority for implementation. And it was this transfer from research into delivery of services that highlighted to me that there needed to be further quality evidence in, in some areas around new developments in mindfulness. So this brings me just briefly to, to touch on my PhD research. Um, my, I started um, focusing on a targeted mindfulness approach for people with cancer, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy for cancer, funded by Tenevis Cancer Charity. Um, it was um, through this that we, I was able to um, think about some of the appropriate ways of evaluating the benefits and the costs associated with delivering mindfulness within the, within the NHS. Um, I also um, took a public health approach to consider early intervention in depression prevention and went on to collaborate with colleagues re researching mindfulness in schools, including a chapter in my thesis on the value of more, a more universal mindfulness approach. Uh, which aim to build resilience and promote positive mental health. 
and this is an area that's growing um, mindfulness in schools, particularly in Wales. Um, that there's a clear opportunity um, argued for mindfulness to be embedded within the, the new um, national curriculum in Wales. Um, and it's this universal approach to mindfulness that also transfers over to thinking about mindfulness for well-being in general, to tackle those life stresses that we never inevitably face through our personal and professional lives. I'm just going to end um, on thinking about some resources available for mindfulness um, for for our, our, our well-being as ECRs. There's opportunities to learn about mindfulness through um, at-home reading, listening and practice. So this book um, pictured on the top right there, Finding Peace in a Frantic World, um, has made mindfulness much more accessible to people who want to, um, to have a go in their, own, in their own homes. There's also a number of free resources available through connecting with organisations such as Mindfulness Wales, and through the Centre for Mindfulness Research and Practice. And if um, people are interested um, in, in accessing um, more formal mindfulness support as a preventative approach, um, there's, um, there's, there's group-based mindfulness courses available. It's provisions, um, it's patchy across the UK, um, but many GPs are now able to refer people to receive mindfulness um, as part of um, ongoing um, management of depression. Thank you. I'm going to slightly put you on the spot. And if you don't know anything about it, just feel free to say no. But I was going to ask you about the Myriad trial um, and what your thoughts were. So basically, the Myriad trial was a large, well-designed trial on mindfulness in schools. Um, in teenagers and secondary schools and basically no effect was found and actually adverse consequences were found in, in adolescents with a history of mental health problems. Did you have any thoughts on that? Because it was a really surprising finding, wasn't it? Yeah, it is a study I'm, I'm familiar with more so thinking about the economic evidence that was attached to it, which is, was the focus of my PhD research. It was interesting on, on so many levels around the, the various findings they had. Um, I, I don't know about the, you know, the, adverse, um, the adverse findings that they found, but it does relate to a, you know, some, something around the challenges of evaluating complex interventions at this scale. Um, and you know how sometimes the the tools that we apply are difficult to measure you know both the benefits and the costs um and that sometimes um you know there's lots of things that change over time naturally so i think the, the myriad trial you know obviously had um control groups to try and to consider what would happen naturally over time anyway um but some it's 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 challenging to unpick what's going on, um, particularly at that time in people's lives where they're going through that period of transition. So I think um, there's there's more work that needs to be done to consider, you know, when um, and it's the same in other areas around um, depression prevention. There was a time where um, mindfulness was recommended, but only for people who'd had three or more episodes, um, and then. There was a shift in, in thinking and research around whether actually it was more related to people who'd had childhood trauma, where mindfulness might be a particularly useful tool. Um, and there's, you know, again, there's more, there's much more in the ways today around thinking about groups where maybe mindfulness is not an appropriate intervention. I, yeah, and I guess there's something to be thought about, isn't there, about the large scale deployment at population level of interventions where the evidence base is still developing. It, it's, it was and a really challenge. interesting trial, no, not least because it's, it can be really hard to publish trials with meh findings, isn't it? Because the journals don't want to publish them. Um, however, uh, I think it was, I think it was the BMJ evidence-based mental health. I can't remember the journal precisely, but they they basically published a whole issue 
on that trial because because as you say it's those these sorts of complex interventions um there's lots to discuss around it so thank you very much so uh dr amos is a research so becky's a research officer on adverse childhood experiences at the school of medical and health sciences at bangor university she's currently working between sort of Bangor Public Health Wales and the National Centre for Population Health. Um, and her research interests broadly focus on mental health, its determinants and lifelong impact. So we too have lots of overlaps there, Be Becky, in our research focus. So I'm gonna hand over to you. I will focus on some things that um, I looked at in my PhD specifically. So the population that I was focused on was sexual minority adolescents, just given uh, the amount of work that was lacking in that area, um, especially within a UK context. But we'll get into that as the talk progresses. Um, and I really wanted to bring my own experience of well-being and, and what I'm trying to be as an ECR moving forward and how I would like to in invite everybody to really think about your own well-being and how we can integrate in our day-to-day -day lives and to, to get the best out of our careers. Okay. Um, so this is just a snapshot of one of the chapters of my PhD, um, which has been published in uh, The Lancet Child and Adolescent Health. Um, so in this piece of work, we used a population-based cohort study. Um, so a very high quality piece of um, a high quality data set, which is just a great resource for any researcher. Um, and we looked at a number of indicators, but just for today, I'll, I'll focus on the mental health aspects. Um, so using measures that were in the uh, Millennium Cohort, we found uh, depressive symptoms were really high in sexual minority adolescents. So this, this kind of pattern emerged as young as 14 years old. And when we say sexual minorities, it's anyone with a non-heterosexual um, identity or attraction. Um, so you can see comparatively, um, so 54% was for the um, sexual minority group that had depressive symptoms compared to 15% for the um, non uh, the heterosexual comparison group. It was really high for self-harm as well. Um, so that's lifetime incidents. And again, for low life satisfaction. So what we found in a nutshell were there was significant mental ill health disparities. Um, and has, as has been alluded to, mental ill health and mental well-being can be seen differently. So um, I'll, I'll just go a bit more into the well-being side of it, because that we wanted to know more about what makes uh, what contributes to feelings of well-being in a positive way, but also what kind of lowers it. Um, so we did a systematic review. So um, a scope in the uh, research that was available in the extent literature. Um, so from that, and again, it was a focus on sexual minority adolescents, what, what is associated with higher rates of well-being and lower rates of well-being. So we found that psychological factors or ones that were like more proximal to the individual tended to be associated with lower well-being. So you have these outs, outside kind of external stresses, um, such as perceived discrimination, and they become internalised. And by a function of that internalisation, um, people experience lower well-being rates. Um, and then that also uh, it talks about meta stereotyping in this figure, which is uh, the expectation that heterosexual populations will have negative viewpoints of sexual minorities. And things that were tended to be really positive were kind of these broader um, social uh, kind of interpersonal level uh, variables such as family and friend support, having a romantic relationship, um, I suppose is extremely supportive in many ways. It kind of validates your relationship. And also it's somebody that you can talk to um, on a very inter intimate level. Um, and being out in your identity was also associated with, with higher rates of well-being because um, the concealment and the shame that can be associated with sexual minority status um, obviously perpetuates the cycle of of um, mental Ill health. So the, the takeaway message here was extraneous variables such as, you know, social variables seem to be really um, a good way to promote well-being and looking at more of these psychological um, factors that were pernicious seem to be associated with reduced well-being. 
So um, because that was a systematic review and we found a lot of limitations with the research that was available um, in terms of methodological quality and um, just a lack of it. And there wasn't there was nothing that was done in the UK until this point. Um, we decided to construct a uh, conduct a constructivist grounded theory. Um, so from the grounded theory, um, we found it, we developed a hierarchical model. So it has three layers to it. Um, sitting atop is the culture. So the cultures um, that that then inform the way that somebody thinks about themselves and their own identity as they navigate through adolescence. How this culture is enacted. So um, how the social group might. Um, enact that this is how a culture should be this is how you should perceive yourself and this is the membership um, these are the rules of membership for this group and then at the lower level which really speaks to the well-being aspects as uh, in terms of the talk today is one's individual experience as a consequence of all of those factors um, so I don't want to go into this too much because it would take a lot of time but this is something that will be published and so keep your eye out for it um, so this kind of heteronormative narrative uh, in terms of rigid gender roles, the heterosexuality is default, tends to be um, perpetuated very early on to young people, irrespective of what sexuality states they have. And people who don't fit that membership or don't seem to fit those roles um, can experience othering, overt hostility, and also there seem to be a general suppression of um, other identities that weren't heterosexual. And so at the experience layer, that kind of results in feelings of um, internalized homonegativity that that um, being gay or non-heterosexual is wrong or shameful concealment of identity to protect yourself or um, in a family situation to not be feel rejected or in some worst cases you know lose that kind of relationship with your family and then there was this interaction with queer space over time as as through a process of othering essentially um, the queer space became available to, to young sexual minorities. Um, and there was a talk of adversity and there was a talk of, of um, mainly seeing other sexual minorities being treated badly and how that affected them and made them conceal their identities. But over time, this led to a commitment to supporting others um, and an inbuilt resilience and confidence because by being in a queer space, by interacting with one's identity, um, they don't have to conform to these rigid social structures that that might be promoted in the heteronormative space. So there are some positives um, to it as well, which hasn't it's not like a massive thing in the sexual minority research domain. Um, so I wanted to talk about my empirical work, but then I wanted to move on again, as I said, to my experience of being an ECR and where I want us all to go, not just me. Um, so focus on, on mental health and workplace stress and, and well-being has been alluded to is all of these things that are presented in this slide here. Um, so I thought it would be nice to contextualize what it's what what why we might be stressed as ETLs, why our well-being is so important. You've got a lot of pressure to build your research portfolio. We all feel it, you, you know, we're all starting to um we've probably already started to make significant moves and we've all already been so successful to get to this point um but it can feel like an uphill battle i suppose we're trying to role model people who are already successful and it can feel really difficult and a lot of us are in short-term contracts or face some kind of financial precarity and what i would just wanted to say with this was you deserve so much more you deserve deserve to give yourself the compassion that this is the situation you're in whilst realizing that you are trying to uh, make moves in your career. So building a career re requires this real investment in your own health and your own well-being to uh, in facilitate that longevity. So this is in no way empirically led questions, but these are things that I would encourage people to ask themselves and think about um, whether you're on a on a journey to manage your own well-being afresh or these something that's part of your life already. Think about what fills you up, what you do to look after yourself right now, what kind of things you might want to do differently and what gets in the way. And these are questions I've asked myself and I ask myself on a daily basis. And I think Tegan talked about well-being in a PhD and I've only just finished my PhD and I think um, this, this it's a point where you really ask yourself, how can I keep myself well over time facing such significant stress? Um, and so these are some 
I'm a bit of a self-help fan. I love all of those kind of books. So um, these are some tips from books that I've read. So learning to create a clearing gives us our life. So make an emotional space to be who you are versus doing things. Um, we're very focused on our productivity. Um, I think it's just taking a bit of a moment and it doesn't have to be hours and hours at a day. Um, and that speaks to the next point. What can you do with your minutes as opposed to your hours or days? And I found that really comforting um, advice from this book by Brianna West, because you can do quite a lot in a couple of minutes and it doesn't have to be. It's more of that um, informal mindfulness that Lucy spoke about. Um, again, relaxing isn't something you do to pamper yourself. It's absolutely essential. So I think my my mission, secondary mission to being a researcher is to encourage us all to really prioritize our well-being um and relax and you are so super important um and so it takes courage to say yes to rest and play in a culture where exhaust exhaustion is seen as a symbol status um so i would just encourage you to think of these things as you move on to be an ecr you're going to also progress in your career as you you know you hope to do you'll become a role model so what do you want to be for the next people coming up the next dcrs do you want them to think they have to burn themselves out or do you want to say this this is a work-life balance that's going to be obtained so just to let you know um i'm a well-being champion um at Bangor university so this is an initiative that the well Bangor has really trying to prioritize well-being for researchers so it might be something you do at your own institutes and if you are a member of staff at Bangor and you want to get in contact um, you can visit the Wellbeing Champion page and, and find out all this information and talk to somebody in a who will offer that empathetic and confidential space for you, a safe space. Um, so just because of in terms of time, I will leave it at that. Um, here's some references that you might want to look at. Um, and thank you so much for your time, everybody. One of my questions relates to the work. Um, in terms of, so you've created a model, mm -hmm. but to my mind, mm -hmm. this is an ever-changing world at the moment, isn't it? So I think things were quite static for a while, mm -hmm. but now, mm -hmm. for young, the younger generation, the terminology, the feelings, the attitudes are really rapidly changing. You know, so I would say in my field, mm -hmm. um, the social media world is rapidly changing. And so, yeah. it's really, you know, the minute we get something out, the mm -hmm. field we're in has moved on. Do you think that's, mm -hmm. that's the same? Yeah, I think, yeah, it's really interesting because another thing... Um, that I that I've faced, you know, uh, kind of presenting work or talking to younger people is, oh, it's changed so much. It's changed so much. Yes, it has. Um, but there's these. I think the main finding of my work was this narrative is still very there. Um, so it seems, you know, you've got because a, a kind of key question is in the face of all this socio political change and the social attitudes that are changing, it seems so much more positive how come people are feeling this bad still um how come we see such elevated rates and ho hopefully over time they will continue to reduce and reduce and this won't be um a disparity half as bad as it is now um i think with the model that we've developed um it is supposed to be a dynamic one i, I think sometimes it's quite difficult to represent findings especially qualitative findings in models where it doesn't seem static. And we called it the dynamic identity formation for a reason that is dynamic. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And in the queer culture, it's ever expanding. So that is represented in that qualitative work that will be written up. Because um, queer spaces have evolved over time to incorporate asexual people, intersex people. Yeah. Um, I think the main findings from and this is in a lot of minority research, is that minoritization in, is in itself the issue or feeling othered and that membership. And um, so just be, yeah, so I think it will change, um, but I think it highlights and it's needed to be said that these issues are still very, um, very and, prevalent. And, and you very much wonder whether it's generational. So, so... Mm. So, so within the social 
me so this is not my area of research but just thinking about that dynamic nature um you know within the generation of young people yeah there's an understanding that hasn't transferred to wider society so yeah. so the impacts you know because for all minority groups there's that experience of othering isn't it and that yeah. and to me that's a commonality in yeah. the experience but then within that mm -hmm. there are groups where you can measurably yeah find differences isn't there mm -hmm. and there are groups where you can't mm -hmm. and, and I would put you know children and young people within that queer world are in one of the worlds where you can yeah. measure the differences yeah, I think another another thing is a lot of this work is pioneered in places like the USA and the Netherlands, and that was a major um, thing of the PhD that was not very much in the UK. And we know that the attitudes aren't vastly different here, so why has it not been done? If you don't measure it, you don't know. And I think that's that we're trying to make a foundation of of that. Well, what is the status? Oh, it's it's actually really not that great. If we just assume politi political change, social change follows mental health change is not always right and I think a, another thing that I would highlight is um it's not always um necessarily generational it's it, it's effect it seemed to be affected by so many things you know where somebody lived you know um yeah, yeah, yeah. political affiliation you know uh, working class backgrounds like um religion people, ethnicity status yeah, yeah. so there's a very intersectional layer to it yeah. um so I guess my main um, difficulty putting this piece work is how do we make this really like understandable? So um, that's yeah. So it's something we we um, with Pravita and and my other uh, supervisors are I'm writing up and trying to make comprehensible to a wide population. But uh, yeah. Well, she's excellent. So oh, I, I know that I have all faith that you both will crack that. <laughs> <laughs>